Welcome back to Case Studies. This week, you're gonna learn how to think broadly about your company because the future comes fast and you need to be prepared for it and I'm gonna show you how. Second, how to be opportunistic as the market around you changes because in a fast moving world, being opportunistic and thinking broadly about your company, even if it's a small thing that you have started yourself, is really important. That's coming this week on Case Studies with the BizDoc. The subject this week to help you learn all that is AT&T. We're going to dive into AT&T and understand where it comes from. Many of you asked for a case study on AT&T, said, weren't they one company at one time? Then there was a breakup and a bunch of mergers and acquisitions, and then they're back together again. Well, guess what? That's correct, and I'm going to show you exactly what happened. In the beginning, AT&T was a phone company, and they emerged at the, you know, 100 years ago. And after that, phone service took off in America. And along with it, long distance phone service. And you may remember when you see like old movies or something where you see, I really have to cut this call short. It's long distance and it's expensive. Well now shoot, long distance is on your, on your cell phone. It doesn't matter. You can call short, you can call long. It's all built into your rate plan. But there was a day where you worried about whether calling across town or calling across the country. And across the country costs money. Well, that was the dawn of AT&T, putting phones everywhere. And as a single company merged, as America grew, it became what was called a natural monopoly. It kept expanding, it kept offering more phone service and more cities to more people, and they ended up being a monopoly because no other companies came in to compete. Well, long about uh, 1949, it got the attention of what was called the antitrust regulators, who were worried that there were a lot of companies in America that were monopolies, and they worried that there wouldn't be price competition or innovation for the American consumer, you and me. And the government said, now, you know, we may want some of these to break up, and if they don't break up naturally on their own, we're going to help them break up with what's called antitrust legislation. And sure enough, 1949, right after World War II, the U.S. government stepped in and AT&T, which was called Ma Bell, back when phones had a bell and the phones would ring, ring, ring. You hear those old-fashioned ringtones. As a matter of fact, you can still get that old-fashioned ringtone. It's actually one of the choices on your iPhone. Anyway, Ma Bell is out there providing service to everybody and here comes the government saying, you know what? We need to break you up. So it started in 1949 and it led to a final judgment in 1956, whereupon basically nothing happened. And two wars, six presidents later, finally an even bigger AT&T was in fact broken up. And they broke it up across regions of the United States. And if you're living internationally and you're saying, gosh, I don't understand the regions of the United States, just think of the United States instead of 50 states cut up into six areas. There was 9X, which is basically back in New York, Bell Atlantic near Washington, D.C., Bell South from Atlanta through Florida, Southwest Bell through Texas in the Great Southwest, Ameritech, which was up in Chicago, and finally Pacific Telesis, uh, basically California, and then U.S. West, basically Washington, Oregon, and the Northwest United States, obviously. And then they left AT&T. It had long distance, it had yellow pages, a few other businesses that were in there, but they broke it all up into these seven sisters. And that's what, that's what they were called, by the way, the seven sisters and AT&T. So here you've got it all broken up. And, and now capitalism takes over. And there's a little bonus this week that you need to understand, and that is never bet against capitalism when you're talking about growth. Because companies grow, they want to keep growing, they want to do more. And if they're on the stock market, people that buy the stock want to see the price go up and they want to make more money off their investment. And so, what does a good company look around to do? They want to offer more products, they want to offer in more markets. So it should be no surprise that from the beginning, these seven sisters got an itch to grow and wanted to move places. And this bizarre little chart here, I'm going to show you what happened. So let's step aside for a second. The first thing that was happening here is they were mostly voice, meaning long distance, phone service, a fax line at your house. They were delving into other things, but they were mostly voice companies. And people called them Bell operating companies. I mean, they did Ma Bell on a small uh, scale in your town. 
and then there was AT&T offering long distance and other services. You know, if they thought of themselves more broadly, they probably would have done some conquering on the early internet. But they didn't. They just thought, well, people are going to dial up to the internet and do that. Whereas when you think about internet service providers or access providers, like the early Earthlink and Yahoo and AOL, it probably could have easily come out of one of the seven sisters if they were thinking more innovatively. But they weren't. They just thought about voice. And that's where it started. But they were still hungry to grow. You know, AT&T itself, it was thinking deeper. Over the years, they bought a company called NCR, computer company. They delved into a variety of different things, and they, they really uh, kept going and tried. And uh, at times, stock analysts would say, oh, that was a dumb decision. Look what they've done there. But then we'd look back and see, well, but they tried. And they're out there swinging at the ball and building up. The big issue coming for all of them would be wireless. Wireless would be one of the catalysts that bring them all back together. And the catalyst that did it was the overwhelming uh, opportunity to not just have a home phone, but to sell you and me a wireless line as well. And back in the day, it was called cellular. That was chapter one. And then digital cellular came out, sometimes called PCS, and finally just called wireless. And that second chapter, digital wireless, what we know today is really where it started to happen. So SBC, Southwest Bell, they really got the ball rolling. Uh, they acquired Pacific Telesis, so now these two are together, in 1996. And I was working on a, a digital television project at uh, Pacific Telesis at that time, and they decided they weren't going to do digital television anymore. It was kind of funny. Um, they said, well, they were back thinking about dial tone, and here I thought that I was working with them at a time where maybe they were thinking more innovatively. And then they bought, you know, Ameritech, which was uh, basically in Chicago. And now you've got three of these together. And then a little bit later, they, in the year 2000, uh, Bell South and Southwest Bell did a partnership called Singular. And I'm trying to build the Singular logo there. Those of you around the world probably won't recognize it, but it was another uh, wireless company in the United States that became pretty big. Finally, you had Bell Atlantic and 9X in 97. They get together. A little company called GTE was involved. And ultimately, it led to the creation of Verizon. So now these two get together as Verizon, and eventually they bought Yahoo and AOL as well as they started buying more media companies. So it just shows you they're looking for growth and looking places. Now it bears pointing out that Verizon bought uh, AOL for $4.4 billion long after the peak of AOL, and then just this past year they closed the deal on Yahoo for $4.4 billion. Um, and so I guess if, if Verizon is buying something, I guess it has to cost $4.4 billion. So if you want to sell your company, just send an offer sheet to Verizon and, and put $4.4 billion on it and see if you get a phone call back. Because that's what they paid for both of these. And a lot of people are wondering, you know, what the hell did they buy? But nonetheless, that's the story of this side. So two of the seven sisters are together. And now you've got, you know, four of the seven sisters here. And then guess what? SBC actually buys original AT&T, changes the branding back to AT&T, and it's all put back together again. So now you've got these uh, four of the seven sisters plus Mama Bell together back as AT&T with US West merging with a company called Quest and ultimately called CenturyLink. And if you watch American football or you're living in the Northwest, CenturyLink, you see CenturyLink Stadium where the Seattle Seahawks play. And so that's what that's all about. So finally, we get over here, and I'm going to turn around. What happens next is very, very interesting. Uh, you have now got basically the old joke is, you know, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall. Well, listen, capitalism was putting Humpty Dumpty back together here after the government wanted to take it apart. Um, AT&T... The next step is they made this offer to buy T-Mobile. So T-Mobile USA, they're offering to buy T-Mobile in 2011 for $39 billion. And T-Mobile is like, well, what if the government won't let you? What if the government steps in? They said, no problem. I'll, I'm so confident this is going through. I'll pay you $6 billion if the deal doesn't go through. In other words, I'm offering to buy you for 39 and if the US government or something says I can't, I'm gonna pay you six. 
Sounds like AT&T, the new consolidated rebuilt AT&T, was pretty confident. Well, guess what? Despite the fact that 26 governors supported it, the technology companies came together and they didn't want it. Believe it or not, it was Google and Microsoft and Yahoo and eBay. They all said, no, no, no. We don't want this because if it's just down to Verizon and AT&T and wireless and then T-Mobile is in there, man, you know, we're technology companies and we sell technology and we do things on the internet and the internet's coming through phones. Uh-uh. American consumer is going to pay more for data on wireless phones and that means that our services, all those companies I mentioned, are not going to be used as much on phones. It'll be expensive. So we're against it for that and a bunch of other reasons. Well, the federal government listened and they blocked it. So AT&T went and they had to write a check to T-Mobile. Well, they negotiated it down a little bit, but they wrote a check for $3 billion for T-Mobile to go away and no deal to be done. When you want to do a deal and then you promise $6 billion if it doesn't happen and then it doesn't happen, you're like, oh, sorry, it didn't happen. Here's $3 billion, $3 billion to get nothing. You know, there's a technical term for that. Damn! That's a lot of money to not buy something. So I'll tell you, you know, it's pretty amazing. However, not to be undone, there was still gold in those hills and DirecTV was going to find it. In May of 2014, they bought DirecTV for $67.1 billion. That's a lot of change. Uh, at the time, DirecTV had a lot of debt, and so they were buying the debt, too. To, they were going to pay that off. But nonetheless, now they're in all this wireless without T-Mobile, but then they add to that DirecTV. Then the next thing, they step up and they buy Time Warner for $108 billion, and it was just recently approved. So Time Warner, DirecTV, AT&T, AT&T now has, in the United States, 135 million wireless subscribers, making them number one, and 26 million cable and satellite survivors, uh, survivors, huh, can't even speak today, subscribers, making them number two. And at the end of all this, this DirecTV Time Warner behemoth is worth almost $300 billion with it's kind of funny, you compare that to other people, Verizon AOL is worth about $200 billion and NBC Comcast is worth about $180. You know, you sit back and you look at all this and a couple things come to mind. And the first thing I think we should talk about is you should think broadly about your company. When they were thinking here about voice, one of those companies here at Southwest Bell that would become SBC, they were thinking about transport. I'm going to transport voice, I'm going to transport fax, I'm going to transport wireless calls, I'm going to make you know, a, a national play in wireless, made a joint venture that created Singular that later got rolled in as AT&T Wireless, but I'm thinking transport, and I'm thinking transporting media, and I'm thinking transporting as much as possible for the American consumer. So let's take a look at something. Let's say you're a subscriber to HBO to go. You know, they got that HBO Go product you can get on your phone. You're going to be paying AT&T for data. Then you're paying either DirecTV or Time Warner for your basic cable and for HBO. And at the top of it, AT&T is collecting profit on you in two or three places. So it shows you that a big company has a play around all of us. But you know what? You wonder, is there going to be enough competition out there for to get pricing? Because right now, you really only have three sources in most of the uh, you know, the country, if you look at it, for your service. You know, what if you're a person that's got Time Warner cable at the curb and DirecTV, and those are your two choices? Well, that's both AT&T, and they're not necessarily going to compete with each other real heavy on price, so you don't have a lot of choice there. So some of that is, is not as good as you would, you would think. But getting back to the core point, thinking more broadly about yourself is important. And I'll give you an example. Once upon a time, Kodak, actually had the people that would create Xerox come to them. And they showed them the technology to basically make a copy on paper from one to the other. They showed them how it worked. And Kodak said, that's not a photograph. Mistake. Big mistake. What if they had thought, hey, that's an image. We sell images on paper, color images, black and white images, photos, and that's an image of 
text that people could make a copy of and then share it and read it together. If they had thought of it as an image, they probably would have bought that technology. Instead, that technology became Xerox. And one of the things that's interesting about Southwest Bell, who was really responsible for putting AT&T back together, is they had a vision. And even though there is a vision from the government about breaking a monopoly, companies want to grow and they want to go farther and they think opportunistically. And along the way, one step at a time, Southwest Bell opportunistically rebuilt most of AT&T, leaving CenturyLink out west and the Verizon consolidation in the east. The moral of the story is capitalism will usually beat the government in the long term unless the government just makes something completely illegal and just regulates it out of existence. If they just put up little walls here and there, elections will come and go, elected officials will come and go, and opportunistic business people under the power of capitalism will rebuild things like AT&T. So as you go forward, think broadly about your company. Think about what you do. Be focused on your individual products and build strong winning plans, but also be opportunistic along the way. To learn more and succeed in your business, there are more case studies here on Valuetainment. And please subscribe to the channel with the best content on the internet for the entrepreneur. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth and I hope I left you better than I found you.